In my entire career, I have never been at a company where we did employee feedback or performance evaluation very well. Maybe we did it sort of okay, but not super well. However, this function is absolutely critical if you want your team or your company to improve. Today, we talked to Riot veterans and now game industry experts and consultants on production and game development, Ben Karsich and Aaron Smith from Valorant Consulting, who you may also know from the very excellent podcast, Building Better Games. We go practical and deep on both of these topics. These are highly controversial, emotional, and sensitive, but important topics if you want to have an impact. Stay tuned. We are coming at you with real, practical, and usable information and advice coming up right now. Today's episode is sponsored by Data.ai to access estimates for rankings, downloads, revenue, usage, or engagement for millions of apps on the App Store and Google Play. Sign up for Data.ai. And before we kind of dive into the main topic, I thought... If you guys had a you know a minute or two to also talk about yourselves and also about uh, Valorant or Building Better Games, the podcast, I, I I think it'd be great for the audience to hear a little bit more about you guys. Yeah, um, I can uh, Ben, Please. if you want, I can go for uh, it. Start kick off and talk a little bit about Valorant too. Um, so I, yeah, I have a background. Uh, I grew up in Central Coast California, um, so I'm a I'm a born and raised California boy. Um, went to college for film, did that for like a, a year right after the, the the GFC in 2009, hated it, didn't really feel like I fit in. Um, video games were always my thing. And so um, I, you know, when, when I was at rock bottom, I finally decided to do this crazy thing and apply to this video game company no one had ever heard of. I found on Craigslist called Riot Games. And uh, I went there and uh, then League launched and the rest is history. Um, and I uh, spent a, a little over 10 years there and uh, kind of grew from a baby intern uh, getting sandwiches for Mark Merrill all the way up to a development director when I left. Um, so it was a, it was a pretty wild journey. And, and uh, after that, I met Ben there and we did a lot of work together and really found that we had a passion for the craft of production and leadership in addition to making games, which we're also very excited about. And so here we are having started Valarin. And uh, Valarin is really about actually helping companies um, you know, really get access to that secret sauce, the things we found consistently that worked, many of them counterintuitive from what a lot of game companies are focusing on right now. So we're out there trying to spread the good word and add value. Yep. Yep. For me, my, my background was uh, actually military. So I think I got really interested in leadership all the way back, perhaps even in the, in the Boy Scouts. But you know, when I joined the military, I was an officer uh, trained in combat arms and ended up doing logistics, which is very different space. Um, and then went into video game development, another very different space, and getting to see the contrast in leadership between Riot and game development generally and the military, but what, but also kind of identifying and thinking about what stayed true, what was true mm -hmm. in, all in all the cases that I encountered, what were the leadership principles that sort of undergirded success. Um, yeah, that's stuff I love to think about and uh, love to help other people think about. And so I went into discipline development. And yeah, now we do the Building Better Games podcast and newsletter and all that stuff. And that's all about trying to help leaders be better leaders in game development. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we could jump right in. And I wanted to start this topic off by just an observation that from my personal experience as an old guy working in tech and media companies and gaming companies for most of my life, I have to say that I have yet to work at a company that is great at feedback and kind of doing performance evaluation. And mm -hmm. we can talk about both of these topics separately, but I want to start by asking you both, why do you think this practice around feedback and performance evaluation? And in my experience, especially the bigger the company, it, it's often the worse it is. But why do you think it is so bad? Or if you guys disagree with me, please disagree. But um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, have you guys worked at a company where you feel like this practice has been executed well? Am I wrong? Is this being done well somewhere? And I just have never experienced it in my career. So I have worked in an environment. I don't know. When I was at Hearts of Riot, I think this actually operated very well. Um, okay. But I agree with you that broadly, I don't see it operating very well. And 
there are a couple reasons why, and I kind of go into some archetypes of companies that we've seen. Um, and one that's really interesting that popped up in the last couple of years as we started consulting with a lot of startups and uh, mid-sized companies and things like that, we found that a people struggled to give hard feedback because they thought it wasn't nice to do that. Like there was sort of a, I almost call it like this toxic kindness or this like politeness that um, was so ingrained in the culture that to give someone critical feedback almost felt like a violation of, of how everybody should behave. And when I look at that from the outside, it, like that, that's really bad. Um, but when you're in it and everybody's just operating and they're all being kind and encouraging and supportive, lots of good things, by the way, nothing wrong with any of that. But then when you think about, okay, I need to give someone harsh feedback or critical feedback, um, it, it doesn't land well. The other archetype is a company where feedback, and this, this reminds me more of the larger um, publishers um, that, and I, again, we, we, we've worked a little bit with some of those. Um, and I also harken back to my military experience. The feedback's just not desired. It's not wanted there, right? Look, just do your job. Let those people do their jobs. And if they're messing up, well, do your job well, don't get fired. And uh, I think behind both of those, there's this idea that if you give feedback, you at you're attacking the person, the individual right. is under assault. And this is the fundamental misunderstanding that if you could get a company or group, and this is what Aaron and I actually have managed to create and been a part of, I think at times uh, in, in the teams and organizations we worked with, um, if you can get a group to really buy into the idea that feedback is about a moment in time, it's about a behavior, it's about a capability, it's about a particular project, it doesn't define the person who's receiving the feedback uh, in any way. I think that is one of the biggest sort of mental hurdles you can get people over. But when it is viewed that way as I give you feedback, therefore you're bad as a person, I think that is why so many people struggle with it. They struggle to give it well. They struggle to receive it well because it, it hits at your center. If someone's like, you did a bad job on that project planning, right? Like I'm a producer, right? Like you did a bad job on project planning. Um, if I interpret that as I'm bad, Mm -hmm. at project planning, but I, but those first two words, I'm bad, then I really try to avoid feedback because it, it messes with my own ability to, to operate and to feel confident about who I am and the work I'm doing and all these different things, um, versus a frame where you say, Hey, this project plan didn't go well. Here's why. And, and I go, Oh, got it. I can do better next time. Yep. Nope. Some of those things are valid. Some of them aren't. That's okay. Uh, let me see what I can learn from this and do better next time. And that comes down to a concept called the uh, growth versus fixed mindset. Carol Dweck, um, we talked about that uh, a bit on, on our stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's just this idea of like, are you open to the growth and the feedback that can lead to the growth? Yeah, one, one thing I'll add to that is that I think the mentality towards feedback within organizations is fundamentally broken. Mm -hmm. I think most people consider that feedback that they consider that the way that they should interface with feedback is in a reactive way. So, mm -hmm. so, but you'll, you'll, most people think of that in terms of, well, I need to give feedback when something bad happened. And I think the good, the sort of enlightened thinkers out there in the world will say, well, hang on a sec. We should also react by giving feedback when something good happened. And they're the sort of ones on the bleeding edge. To me, the idea that feedback is a reactive state is the problem is inherently flawed as a concept. If we as organizations viewed feedback from a proactive state, it's something we're constantly doing with each other all the time, the good, the bad, the ugly, we're, we're constantly opening the door to a conversation about how we're all performing, how the team is performing, how you are performing. Did you do great on these things and not so great on these things? And are we able to talk about those things that are uncomfortable? And do we push ourselves every single day to to have those uncomfortable conversations, therefore to build resilience into the organization to having more and more awkward conversations about performance and about values and about outcomes and about effort and all these things. I, I, I feel like most leaders default stance is that on a good day, if everything went perfectly, I shouldn't have to say anything. Like I mm -hmm. shouldn't have to give any feedback at all because I shouldn't have to have any uncomfortable conversations. And I actually think that we need to flip that script 
yeah. and start changing the culture to being on a good day that is just free flowing and happening all the time. And that that is a fundamental shift as well that we rarely see in organizations. I think because of the political nature of organizations, it is like, let's, you know, minimize that. Like we're doing well if we've minimized that. Yeah. So when you think about how you flip the script on this, to, to use your words, I, I think there's something, I, I kind of think about it at two levels, right? So there's there are the people who might be very reactive, very defensive, who would take things very negatively. And mm -hmm. then there's also sort of the general environment in terms of like the company, whether mm -hmm. it's the culture or the way that things are established. If, if you are a manager or a leader at a company, how should you think about both of these things? Like, how do you start to begin to think about flipping the script in an organization or on a team where we, we have this, and I would call it very typical, traditional, 90% plus of companies have this situation where you give the negative feedback, someone is going to take it negatively, and there's really like almost no benefit for me to give a coworker or a direct report, really direct feedback, because the only thing that would likely happen is a negative effect. Somebody then retaliates or gives me a poor performance review because I gave them a poor performance review, things like that. But again, just yeah. to kind of recap, organizationally on a pers personal basis, how do we begin to flip the script? It's, it's difficult to flip the script because some of the most powerful tools you'll have in your arsenal, mm -hmm. if you want to flip the script, are going to be things that are at the foundation of your organization. So right. like one of them is, the, the, the pr proverbially speaking, the thicker the skin is, of the people within your organization, the easier it will be to drive a culture where those conversations are free flowing. Now, having thick skin is something that comes with experience. It's uh, very related to personality characteristics and attitude and behaviors and these things. And Ben and I often say that when you're talking about attitude, personality characteristics, these things, they're harder to train in to an organization that doesn't already have them. So what do we often say? Well, how, what's the best way for me to get those things, Aaron? Well, hire people that already have them. You know, And so there is a little bit of a catch-22 there that we recognize. That being said, if you're not already there, you can train it into the organization, but it's going to be one of those cultural things that requires constant high-touch accountability from your senior leadership and also the senior leadership demonstrating that they do that within their group. Because if they don't do that, like I, I can't tell you how many times Ben and I have gone into an organization and had the executives reflect to us that they would like to see people talking more or having harder conversations. And then just knowing that there's like awkward three or four awkward elephants in the room just between the executive team mm -hmm. themselves that like all you have to do is hang around for a couple hours to start to pick up on. Yeah. And but it, so it's like, well, I mean, you know, th you're setting the pace in all of the subconscious ways and the conscious ways, right? Mm -hmm. So you're never going to see a longer term change if you don't change your behavior at the top. Um, and that's, that's tough to do, right? Um, so when it comes to, again, flipping the script, one of the things is, you know, building resilience. Uh, Mark mm -hmm. Merrill used to talk about this a lot at Riot, and I always appreciated it. He was like, we need to keep feedback free flowing because it's a it's a helpful tool in building the resilience of the recipients of the feedback. Like the more you receive feedback, the better you get at it and the more used to it you get. And then it becomes a table stake to just always be receiving feedback. And you, you start to, you, you, your skin just naturally thickens up. So that's one piece. Another one I think is training people to give feedback effectively early yeah. and often. And then the third thing I think is creating an accountability structure in the culture that says, back to what we were talking about earlier, if we've gone several weeks and nobody's giving any feedback, that's a bad state. And we're mm -hmm. going gonna to pump the brakes and we're going to step back and we're going to say, why aren't we doing this? How do we start doing this immediately? Like there needs to actually be corporate level, for lack of a better term, accountability around actually executing the feedback on a regular basis. It needs to be something that leaders talk about and ask their teams about like, hey, are you all doing this? Hey, are we doing this? Hey, we missed an opportunity to do this, like constant accountability, um, because it is a really, really big fundamental shift in behavior. The, the thing... Um... 
a few things flow in my head when I think about this topic. One is the idea of psychological safety and its importance, and also I think how often it's misunderstood. Um, uh, and I think psychological safety is often like, well, we need to create an environment where everything's safe, and that means we can't threaten everybody, anybody ever. And if feedback is threatening, we can't talk about feedback. I'm not saying everybody says this, but I've certainly seen that as an anti-pattern. And that leads yep. to that, that toxic positivity, right? The toxic kindness. Mm -hmm. um, I love what Aaron's talking about where he talks about the thickening of the skin. And I think it's actually psychological safety is, a, in, is present in a place where people are willing to be vulnerable with each other. And as a leader in a space, lead with vulnerability to encourage others to follow. Not everybody mu will, but... That's one of your best ways to drive some of the change. And what that means is ask people for hard feedback and kind of, you know, even early, like be a little bit intense about if they're not giving you real stuff, they're like, oh, no, you're doing great. No, no, no. Like where, how could I be doing better, right? Ask your, ask the people on your team. If you're leading a team, those you lead, those you serve, right? Ask them, how can you do better? And take what they say seriously. And model that it's a positive thing that you're thankful that they gave you the feedback. And so um, there's, there, that's one way that you can start leading by example is request it and then respond well to it. Another is by giving it and giving it positively and negatively. As Aaron said, proactive stance here. We had uh, someone, Fr Francis Frey came to our organization and talked a lot about feedback culture because Riot had almost in certain parts of the environment gone too far on the feedback side where feedback just meant like it was a good thing to give feedback. And what that meant is you constantly walked around and just critiqued people and walked away. You're just like, well, that's wrong and dumb because blah. And like, oh, you clearly weren't thinking about this. And then you walked out of the room and it yeah. was like, well, look how good I am at feedback. No, that's not good feedback, right. right? That's just you, you know, being somebody who is capable of spotting problems, dropping problems on people and then, you know, exiting the, the room in the environment and acting like you did something positive. They don't know what to do with that. And it does start leading to a place where people feel less safe. It does actually break down people's ability to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So instead, think about the positive feedback you can give as well. Give a lot of positive feedback to your team, right? If you're a leader or you're just a team member, right? This is game makers, there's a lot of game devs out there. Give When you see somebody else do something that is good, even a little bit, call that out, encourage that. One of the things, like human beings are so responsive to encouragement. And so if you see something good, encourage it, you, you'll probably see more of it. And if yeah. everybody's doing that with the good stuff, now we're increasing the good stuff. And it also means that now I'm trusting the people around me because I see that they're seeing the positive things I do. They're encouraging me that if they give me negative feedback, I know it's not because they think I'm bad because they're trying to tear me down. I know it's because they care about me. And they've spotted my good things. They want me to do better. They're probably calling out something I'm doing wrong because they want me to do better too. So the, that, those are some simple things. Yes, give a, like develop the thicker stick in. Also develop an environment where there is vulnerability. That's possible. Like that's the true nature of, um, of psychological safety, I think, is when vulnerability can be expressed and heard and mm -hmm. everybody's open to that and to the learning that comes from that. Um, but also like I, I was reading Collaboration Equation by Jim Benson recently. And he got into a, a big argument with his manager. And after the argument, they were like yelling at each other in someone's office, you know, way back in the day. And um, I love this example because after someone walked over and was like, hey, do you, do you want to file a complaint? And he was like, what? And he's like, yeah, I mean, that's a grievance. You know, that's a senior director just talking to you, a rank and file. He's not allowed to talk to you that way. Do you want to file? a?" He's like, no, I don't want to file a complaint. He's like, well, he can't do that. It makes you unsafe. He's like... It is totally safe because I was able to have that conversation. The right. unsafe thing would be if I couldn't have that argument with him. We we're talking about the project, not each other, right? And I'm going to go work it out with him. And he just sort of told the guy to like, you know, get out of here. I don't want to file a complaint. That was an example of, and I'm not saying that's the place for everybody to be at where you're all yelling at each other or whatnot, but sure. there was psychological safety there to have a heated conversation. And that came from them, their willingness to give each other feedback to process that, to go back, to think about it. And they, they eventually came to a, a really good conclusion and, and worked together. I, you know, I haven't finished the book yet, but um, yeah, it was a really cool example of like collaboration sometimes looks messy. It looks heated. It looks like conflict because it is. Right. Um, and so you have to create an environment where that can live. Right. So one thing that I'm thinking about as you guys are talking about this kind of feedback and 
and Aaron, to your point, there's got to be like accountability and, you know, hardening the skin requires reps. And mm -hmm. I think some of the ways that you guys have described seem more on the individual level where like you are asking for feedback, you are kind of like directing your own path at a company to get feedback. But these mm -hmm. largely seem like more informal systems. And so mm -hmm. one of the things um, I would be curious about, is, whether at Riot or elsewhere, what kinds of formal systems do you think should be in place? And one thing I also think about, just, just so that you guys, so just from my own experience, one thing that I changed was that to, to kind of um, basically disassociate performance and feedback where, mm -hmm. so now what I do is we, we I kind of chuck performance evaluation out the, at the window. I don't know if that was good or bad. And instead I'm doing like monthly start, stop, continue where mm -hmm. it's not formally tracked. This, this is basically, here's my feedback to you. You take it. And basically this is more informal so that it's not like this. Yes. Okay. Here are the, the, the yeah. bad things you're doing and it's going into your performance evaluation and it's like being tracked. So I, I guess what I'm wondering just to get back to the point is from a formal kind of, when we're talking about ceremonies around feedback, more formal systems, what do you guys think about the kinds of systems that would work or would be more effective when it comes to feedback? Yeah, there's, I, I like the idea of um, regular check-ins and, and the specific thing you mentioned there that's intriguing to me is that you deliberately separated them from the form, from any formal performance evaluation. Yeah. So it's like going to the gym and being like, well, I'm going to kick it up to 50 pound dumbbells today, but then you couldn't quite get enough reps in back to your point about reps. And so you, yeah. you know, you drop the weight, you feel a little silly, but that's about the extent of the consequences versus going to a, a weightlifting, your uh, competition in your local town. Now you lost the competition because you weren't able to. So it, it gets you in the mentality of always practicing and trying to push yourself to the next level without the severe consequences of like, well, you got this promotion or you didn't get this promotion. I think that's, yeah. that is actually a really clever management tool. And also by the time the competition, if you, if you follow the analogy does come around, you've already been practicing so much as part an inherent part of the system that by the time the competition comes around, you're very comfortable and used to practicing all these different, um, you know, weightlifting techniques or whatever. Um, as far as formal tools, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to note that a lot of the companies that are best at this don't have those formal tools. And one of the yeah. reasons why is because again, it's such a culturally foundational thing. Like, the, mm -hmm. like a lot of times I think at Riot, it really did come out just from the people who were hired. We, so we knew when we were doing interviews, we were looking for the people that were more inherently comfortable with that kind of communication and we would hire those people. And so actually, I think it was a, a, a miss on Riot to not have more formal tools around this. One formal tool I did see that we used on our teams was actually to get the team together every six weeks and sit down in a room and actually go round robin with everyone on that specific leadership team where one person was in the hot seat and the other five people would give them feedback openly in front of the group. And it was extremely awkward and uncomfortable both ways. It was awkward and uncomfortable for the person in the hot seat because they were not allowed to talk. They could only listen and take notes. That was the rule. Mm -hmm. And for the, for the givers of the feedback, it was awkward because now you're having to sort of declare what you think about this person's performance, what's working, what's not, their attitude, all these things in front of five other people. So it was just awkward all around, but it, it was a very specific process that we would execute every six weeks where we'd get into a conference room, a private conference room and do this. And, and actually I would say about 80 or 90% of the point of this was to actually build that resiliency and that comfort yeah. so that when we were outside of the context of that room, just going up to the other person and saying, Hey, um, I think you could have done better with X would be a much easier conversation. And that actually came out of um, the live services group at Riot. They developed that process and used it within their group. And, you know, some of us just stole it and requisitioned it because it was such a valuable way to sort of build, again, do the reps. As you said, we were just constantly doing feedback reps all the time. I, um, I'll also say that mm -hmm. as somebody who's part of that, while I think the first time you do it, it's pretty awkward both ways. Yeah. As you get used to it, it doesn't it becomes less awkward um, quickly? 
and you because you realize the other people in this room again they're not here just to gain points by taking me down a notch right gain relative status by by you know demoting me in everybody's mind let's say um they're here to help me and i'm here to help them and if we all are succeeding which is what we want then man imagine how much better we could be if we actually paid attention to each other and we gave this feedback well um and so the, you know another another tool that was a a formal tool and i like these um they're 360 reviews uh you can do those and i think one of the big things is the person that's having the 360 review that's at the center of the 360 review right that's saying like okay these people are all going to give feedback about me if you're the their manager and you're kind of running that process what you said is so important separate it from performance evaluation and that might mean that if you do this let's say you do both every six months have them separated uh you know, have them be every three months, you get one of those things and then it sort of rotates. So that's three months apart from the last time, uh, from a, from a time perspective, because if they happen, I think this was a mistake when, uh, when riot first did this, they had them both happen kind of at the same time. It was like, right. We did a bunch of performance, uh, like 360 reviews and stuff. And then immediately after we had performance evaluations mm -hmm. and you could just see how the, those two things got con like twisted up in people's minds and, because of some consequences to certain people that after that, you just had people very deliberately selecting people on their 360 review boards that were only going to say good things about them because if they said bad things and I wouldn't get a promotion or I wouldn't get a raise or I might get fired or whatever it was, like you, didn't, you don't want that association. But that comes back to the idea of if this is a culturally present thing, that's when you're winning because now people are always doing it all the time. You don't go a week without getting feedback. So... When it's performance review time, yeah, I got a bunch of feedback in the last month, but I always get a bunch of feedback in the last month. We all do. It's just part of how this rolls. And one of the most important things that I think the leaders at Riot did, and I'll say there are limits to this, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of describe the technique. When you heard somebody talking about someone else in a negative fashion, no matter how polite or impolite that was, you pushed that person. You, you, the thing that someone would say it was it was like a, a a meme almost at riot, right? It was this. It was such a cultural tenant. What did they say when you told them? And if they were like, ah, shoot, you know, especially once you'd been there a bit, you knew like, ah, crap, I was talking about somebody and I haven't talked to them yet. Um, I need to go talk to them first, you know, <laughs> before I go and complain to anybody else, I need to go talk to them first because one of the things that happens when you go talk to that person, you are forced also as the feedback giver to understand the complexity of their reality because maybe they're going to talk to you and be like, well, this is why I was doing that. And you're going to be like, oh, shoot, I thought you were just a jerk. In fact, there's a bunch of good reasons for why you haven't responded to this or you haven't done that or whatever. Um, and and then, by the way, you then continue that conversation. You go like, okay, well, what could work, right? And you, now you start working on a solution rather than just talking about this person as if they are a problem. Um, so that was so embedded in Riot's culture for such a long period of time. And I think that meant that people were constantly giving and receiving feedback. Not always great at it, but it was it was happening. It was happening a lot. And I think when that started to fall apart in certain parts of the company, that was when Aaron and I started getting really concerned, actually, mm -hmm. um, because it it's hard to replicate with broad formal processes like 360 reviews and all this stuff. It has to be part of how people walk around. Um, because the other thing is feedback is like finding bugs. The faster you find a bug in game development, the cheaper it is to fix. Yep. The more rapidly you give feedback to, <clears throat> to the event happening that requires feedback, the more effective that feedback will be. And so if you only do like a 360 review every six months, let's say, you're giving somebody feedback about something that happened four months ago. Your memory is clouded and su and suspect. Their memory is clouded and suspect. Nobody really remembers. And you're just like, I don't know. I just didn't like how you talked to somebody or other. They I they didn't seem to. And it's like, does any? I don't remember that. Ah, shoot. You know, feedback should happen quickly, and that's what you're trying to <laughs> encourage. And that means it is almost definitionally, if it's operating well, an informal rather than a formal process, because formal processes tend to happen at cadences. Right. Um, and you need, you need the faster response. Like you need to, you know, if you're a leader and you've got a manager and you observe their meeting or something and you have a bunch of notes, if you can, as soon as that meeting is over, give them feedback. 
Um, mm-hmm. Again, assuming there's there's safety there and whatever, um, uh, you know, give them feedback immediately after. And they're going to be like, oh, okay, I can remember that. I can remember that meeting. I can remember what went well, what didn't. Wait two weeks and it's like, I'm sorry, I've been in like 50 meetings. I don't remember what was going on. Um, so anyway, that that would be, yeah, There, I think this is something cultural. It is something that should be informal. And yes, if you have formal processes that assist, great. But the default of feedback needs to be uh, informal, actually. It needs to be behavior. Right. And I, I, I do think that um, I, I feel like the informal systems are often much more effective just because if it's not formally tracked, then you're not holding back as much, right? Where you mm-hmm. can yes. be more honest because, you know, it's just for that person. And that yes. person's going to take it as, okay, uh, this the the reason why I'm receiving this feedback is for for my benefit, or ho- hopefully they interpret it in that way. Um, but may- maybe my next question is 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 around feedback is really around the delivery of feedback because this is something that I've mm-hmm. kind of struggled with throughout my career in that I tend to be very direct and mm-hmm. clearly not everyone is the same. There are some mm-hmm. people who just want it straight up. Just tell me what I'm doing wrong. I want to get better. Just be very direct. Don't, you know, don't sugarcoat anything. And then there's other people where, you know, they, you, you got to get the shit sandwich out, right? So the, so the nice and then the, the real feedback and then the nice thing. Um, and so w- when you think about delivering feedback to different people, how have you thought about it? I've been more of like a more more of the Rambo over my career, and I'm st- slowly starting to get a little better bit better at like nuance and adapting feedback to different people. But if you guys were to give recommendations or suggestions on how to think about delivering delivering this, you know, what is essentially this the same message, but to different people in a more optimized way, how would you guys think about that? Yeah, it, one of the challenges with some of the conventional corporate methods we're trained to use when it comes to feedback, it, like the poop sandwich, for example, <laughs> is uh, the, the I don't think that I can't imagine someone who actually feels better when they get a poop sandwich because you know that there's poop in it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the, 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 the lovely bread, tomato and lettuce that you added on there is merely a delivery mechanism for the poop. So like, it's hard not to be cynical if you know, you can feel in the air what's happening, you know? Yeah, and yeah. so I, I, I tend to feel like we're still running into that same problem culturally where we're just struggling with the fact that we have to have a tough conversation. Now, yeah. that being said, um, there is, I, I, one of the things I really want feedback givers to understand is that if you're already really pissed off by the time you're giving feedback, or you're already really frustrated, your chances of delivering it in an effective <laughs> way are very low. And this is actually one of the big criticisms I have about most of the corporate model is like, if I were working for like a big sort of draconian, for lack of a better term company, like big established corporation where people didn't give a lot of feedback. And I had some senior director and I was just like a, you know, mid-level producer or whatever. And I had some senior director walking in the room and say, I have some feedback for you. I'd be pooping my pants. You know, it's probably not a good situation that I'm about to go in. And that's because like the only reason anyone would ever give feedback is if things have gotten so bad that they had to, Mm -hmm. they felt obligated to. And so again, there's a proactivity that proactive stance we need to take on this to get ahead of that. As far as the delivery, the impact feedback model from yes. the book, Crucial Conversations, still to me, I use it in my personal life all the time. It disassociates in a very healthy way the nature of the feedback from the other person's emotion and their character. And I think that's the powerful aspect of it. So the, the impact feedback model is to actually uh, provide factual observance, observa- observations, basically. So to say, hey... Um, Sally, I've noticed that you have, um, been to work late the last like two weeks consistently. And, um, your team has mentioned to me that you haven't been showing up to the standups and they haven't really been able to get a a line on like what your work is or what you're doing. And as a result, they're, they're worried that they're going to fail the sprint, the sprint. 
Um, and they feel like you, when they try to bring it up to you, they can't talk to you about it. Um, so, you know, as a result, I'm concerned. And then this is, again, this is the key part saying, I'm concerned that perhaps you're not taking this very seriously, or I'm getting the impression that maybe this isn't very important to you. And then what's, what's key about that part of it is that you're actually now internalizing responsibility for the narrative that you've constructed. Right. Instead of saying, well, obviously you don't care. Or obviously you don't give a crap. That's where it becomes accusationary and that's where, or accusatory, that's where it becomes sort of feels, can feel attacky when right. instead you say, Hey, I'm telling myself this story as a result right. of these things that we both agree have happened mm -hmm. and the impact. So that's the impact that that's having on me. And then follow that up with like, Hey, a recommended change of behavior. So if you could come in on time the next couple of weeks, that would mean a lot to us. Or like, we really need you to do X. Um, this is how you sort of like the three sort of phases of factual observation, impact in the sense of like, this is the impact this is having on me. This is the story I'm telling myself. And then three is recommended a, a behavioral shift or, or specific follow-up actions um, is actually a really, really good model. And it's also very direct and honest too. There's no fluff in there necessarily. I think it's really actually just, again, about psychologically separating the emotional parts from the factual parts. Yeah. The, the, the thing I would add to that too, is when you, when you're giving feedback, a mistake is to believe that you only communicate one way in a feedback conversation. Now, sometimes time doesn't allow for more. And if so, be incredibly careful about giving feedback. In general, one of the things that I do in that, because I love the impact model, I love crucial conversations. It's a book worth checking out if you're struggling with feedback or trying to bring in this idea of, hey, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I am experiencing. This It seems to me that blah. And then you ask, what do you think of that? Like, what are you, what are you hearing? And you, you, you let them respond. And, you know, some people respond to that super well. Some people don't respond to it super well, but actually it can be really helpful uh, for them just to know this is how this is impacting me, right? That's the idea of the impact model. This is how that what you, what you have done has impacted me. Um, this is, this is how, uh, you know, in that case, that, that would be like, to me, there's a, there's a problem there in the one that Aaron described in that, like, wow, some of your team was talking to Aaron about you. And, and Aaron's now reflecting to you that like, hey, they didn't feel comfortable talking to you. Um, and they expressed that to me. It seems to me that's that like, what do you what do you think about that? And, and let there be a back and forth there to build the understanding. So uh, impact model asking questions, then making the recommendation. Um, for, and, and again, if you, if time, if time only allows, like the, the one that Aaron said, I think like facts, impact recommendation, that's sort of the core of it. Um, I love, I love it if I can provide time and space to, for there to be dialogue, uh, because sometimes that helps me realize, oh, there's a lot I didn't see, as I mentioned earlier. And that's something that's always like, it is so, it happens. It is so rare to find somebody who is actually just a malicious agent inside of an organization. Mm -hmm. It is uncommon. Um, and so, so often when you are able to open up that space and say, here's what, what I saw, here's how that impacted me. Questions, right? Like, right. what do you think of that? Um, that also provides then it's less of an attack and it can feel less of like a drive by all of that. That whole thing feels less of a drive by because if I contrast, me saying this is what I saw, blah, 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 versus like, hey, you're really messing up, blah. Or like, do you even care about and or whatever? And you, you hear feedback often when it's especially when there's a lot of um, uh, powerful negative emotion involved. You hear feedback often comes out that way as just like it's just an attack. It is an attack, right? And it's very easy. It puts the other person in a defensive state and they feel like they need to protect themselves. And now they're worried, especially if it's like the senior director talking to the mid-level leader, right? Like, it's, they feel, they suddenly feel like, oh no, well, how do I get out of this? Um, and how do I know that? Wait, that's not true. Oh no, they didn't understand, you know, and, but they don't, if you never get a chance to respond, it doesn't increase your idea of vulnerability. It just is like, oh shoot, how do I make sure I never have a conversation like that again? Right. Um, and so you're, what you'll do is, you know, keep your head down and 
potentially um, even hide your mistakes. And both of those are negative behaviors. Yeah. And I, I wanted to shift over and talk about performance evaluation. But before we do, there's actually a couple of, a couple of other follow-up topics I wanted to kind of cl try to close the loop on regarding feedback. And the, the first is like this notion of like, how do we even like prevent us from getting to the point where feedback needs to be given? And I feel like the number one reason when I think back on my own experience and like mistakes I've seen other people make is basically this lack of communication around what are the mutual expectations of a manager and a direct report. And because it's like a lot of these managers are basically asking, basically expecting their direct reports to read their mind. You're not doing things the way I want you to do. But wait, have you actually talked about, okay, what is your understanding of good performance and yeah. now let me tell you what my expectations are and then to align those so that you never even have to get to that point where like, you are disappointing me. You're not meeting um, mm -hmm. expectations. And so you don't even have to give the feedback. But I, I want to also just talk to you, talk to you guys about whether you think this is as common of a phenomenon as, as it's, it's been in, in my career and from what I've observed. And then what are other ways in which we can even like before it gets to that point, yeah. Be able to communicate or set an environment in which we could even get, get to the point where we can minimize the number. Not, not that we, I mean, you should always still give feedback, but we can minimize the number of situations where performance or other things are kind of slipping where you have to give feedback. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's beyond clear that the issue you're describing about lack of clear expectations and the negotiation around expectations is an epidemic. Like I, I'm comfortable using that term. It's an epidemic in the Western corporate world. Um, I that's I don't have a ton of familiarity outside of uh, the Western corporate world, but certainly in Europe and the U.S., it has become tragically bad um, to the point where I think the vast majority of people have little to no clear expectations between them and their boss or them and the parties they're accountable to. And uh, I agree with you. I think one of the logical outcomes of that is that when feedback and performance evaluations happen, they become punitive and they, they can very become easily become punitive in nature because it's the only time where you can deal with the stuff that upsets you. It's the only time you can deal with the things that bug you. And even worse is that by the time you finally get to that point and everyone can sort of get it all out, all the stuff they've been holding on to, for the last eight to 12 months, now the person on the receiving end is being surprised by 75% of that. And this is just, it's just bad outcomes across the board and it's bad management. It's, uh, I think it's a failure in the discipline of management, people management particularly. Um, most of the good people managers I've encountered in my career fortuitously stumbled upon the skills that allowed them to be good managers. There's not a lot of formal training around this stuff. There's not a lot of formal mechanisms around this. Um, you know, there's a, you know, accountability as a concept is central to this conversation. And it's interesting how many organizations talk about accountability. Like it's the only piece that they'll discuss out of this topic you just brought up. We need more accountability. Like we don't have enough accountability. Our people aren't accountable. We hear this stuff all the time when we go work with executive teams. And it's, and again, it's interesting. If you listen closely to the flavor of the way that's being expressed, that I'm frustrated and I need a way to just like grab people by the shoulders and shake them up and be like, you're not doing what I want you to do. And I need also a, a, a maybe a subtle or not so subtle bat in the back that you see that's ready to smack you over the head with to make you do what you're supposed to be doing. And the thing that somehow no one remembers to do is to sit down and have a conversation <laughs> about here's what I expect you to do up front. Yeah. Here's what good looks like. Here's what great delivery of this project would look like. And so it's interesting. You know, we had a conversation with an executive team we were working with recently where this th that whole stage was set. Like, we need more accountability. People aren't taking this seriously, blah, blah, blah. And we asked the question to the executive team. I said, hey... How, when was the last time you all sat down with your immediate direct reports and really had a conversation about setting clear expectations for the year? 
and they all just kind of had this confused look and awkwardly looked around the room and you know the CTO turned around and said you, you know I I don't think we've ever actually done that and and Ben and I said this is the first step to getting to where you want to go with accountability and so there's there's a whole setting expectations and also negotiating around that too you know it's like I've seen people you know, have a long vacation or a maternity leave or a paternity leave that like shocked everyone and actually materially affected their performance that year. And it could have easily was a conversation that could have easily been taken a note on a piece of paper somewhere six months ago. So it wasn't a surprise to anybody. Um, so these things are, 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 it's really all about like sitting down and, and having that conversation up front. And I, I, I think a lot of that burden does fall on the managers, but I will say to direct reports as well, if your manager doesn't know how to do that, don't just roll with it. Right. You know, sit down and, and initiate that conversation. that conversation because you're the one who's going to suffer in the end if that doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. So I want to I want to dive into the second part of what you were talking about with the feedback. Like, um, how would you reduce it? And it was interesting because at first I was like, OK, hang on. There's a framing thing here. Right. Is feedback a problem? No. But I also get what you're saying where feedback is overhead, you know, from some perspective, you can view feedback as overhead. It's a, it's a growth learning, continuous improvement based overhead, but it's overhead. So yeah. So, okay. How would we reduce it? And I thought through my career of like, how do people give feedback? When do they give feedback? When have they not had to give feedback? And what's interesting is encouraging curiosity and humility can reduce feedback because people will ask more questions and are more likely to have the conversation and not assume they know what's going on upfront. So right. you were saying like there's a case where I'm managing somebody and they go and they do something I didn't I didn't expect. Well, one, we acknowledge that this is just a reality of knowledge work. Like we are in the space of creative endeavor. There are the we describe things in terms of problem, experience, engagement, this sort of thing, and there are multiple solutions to every single one of those problems. And so if we have a specific solution in mind, then we need to tell the other person that. But if we don't even know we have a specific solution in mind, we may not discover it because we assume it's the one that they're going to take and then they take a different one. So one, clarity of expectation setting to what Aaron was saying. And then the second one is the, and this is something that actually I think I have seen more in the highly effective senior game developers across all disciplines that I've interacted with. When they are asked to do something or solve a problem or whatever it is, they will ask questions. They will default to curiosity and they will start asking questions because we're not we're not on a factory line. We're not laying bricks, right? Like this is the wall. It's defined. Lay bricks until the wall is this tall, right? That's it. You know, leave space for this window, this window. Okay, cool. We're done. We are in a space of incredible creative endeavor. Um, and so I think one is you can never get away from all the feedback, but if it's happening more frequently, you will have less of it. Because it's easier to course correct, cor it's easier to course correct if you do it, you know, every two days for five minutes instead of having it all like Aaron was saying, build up, and then it's this right. giant explosion. Nobody knows what to deal, what to do with. And the second is, if you don't want to get a lot of feedback, one, you should understand your own motivations for that. But two, be really curious, be really humble, ask a lot of questions, clarify what people want from you. Um, and so that would be a behavior that I could see in an organization that would reduce the amount of feedback that needs to be given because we're already, we're, we're proactively engaging in the conversation to understand what good looks like in any given situation. Got it. Great. And to just close the loop on feedback, I think the, the last kind of, kind of major issue I see with feedback is the dude or the the girl, whoever, who just cannot give feedback. And so mm -hmm. something's happened and they're seething, right? Mm -hmm. They're just so angry mm -hmm. and upset. And it's like, well, have you talked to Harry or have you talked to Sally about this issue? They're like, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And it's just the anger just continues to boil over mm -hmm. and they haven't done it. They haven't done it. And then, you know, to, to the points that you guys have made before, it often does turn very punitive very mm -hmm. angry. And in my opinion, that's, I think both parties are equally to blame. Yeah. Whoever is at fault and the person, if you're not giving the feedback, you are at least 50% to blame if you cannot give that feedback. But what kind of advice would you give for some of these people? And, 
you know, there, there are actually quite a lot of them in my experience who just mm -hmm. can't, I, the, I don't know what it is. Like some people can just have those conversations and some people, I, I feel like they have all this, I don't know, tension and nervousness or whatever. They just can't do it. Yeah. It's everyone is, everyone is different. Um, yeah. You know, it's, um, I'm, I'm actually going to avoid, uh, too, too specific of an example here, but um, th there's there's someone I know whose family uh, has a um, a distinct history of communicating passive aggressively, and so the way that they sort of uh, get out their negative thoughts or emotions or crit critical thoughts is through like subtle jabs at each other and sort of like throwing a kind of a, a, a mild but stinging comment into the room like kind of rolling a grenade into the room but but to to directly have a conversation is the most terrifying thing that any of them can imagine and they'll actually jab at each other and be quite nasty a lot of the time when they have not nice things to say or they're frustrated um to just to avoid the direct conversation the reason I bring that up is because some people were literally raised with either culturally or family culture or the place they went to school or wherever in a place where like the idea of sitting down with somebody and having a direct conversation is one of the most threatening things that could possibly happen. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's just one of many explanations, I think, for why a lot of people struggle with this. It is absolutely a cultural thing. And so if the cultures that you've been a part of in any system you've ever been a part of in the past have taught you that this sort of conversation is not a good thing or or is to be avoided or whatever um that's going to be with you you're going to carry that with you and you have to work with yourself to address that um that being said it, I, i'll be honest if i were starting a company tomorrow i would screen heavily for this i think ben would screen heavily for this one of the things we, this is one of the reasons why we tell startup founders that like, it's great to have a good game idea. <laughs> it's great to think about how big you want your team to be. It's great to get funding. Like you need to do all these things, of course, but like you, that we often hear startup founders having this conversation and saying, well, culture, you know, like whatever, like I've got a pretty nice group of guys, like we'll figure the details out later. And I'm like, this is one of those details you need to figure out now you can get the best creative director in the industry, but if this person can't give or receive feedback worth a damn, you are literally like walking along with a limp from day one. Mm -hmm. Like, because some of the most critical conversations that will lay the foundation of your very business and product are going to be challenging. They're going to be threatening and they're going to happen today. So really think carefully about who you hire. And because there are some people that it's not that they won't get there eventually, but they may not be there today. And the work required for your team to get them there today may not be an investment that you have the time or energy to make. So it's like you, I, I, we really try to encourage people to be honest about this stuff. It's like, again, we, we lean so far into the skills. Like this person has the best skills. Like, well, they, but no one can talk to them. That's a huge problem. So they're a little black box. We just hope it works. And uh, that's that's not a direction I would go, especially when I had a team of five people. The, the thing too, if I, if I were to have someone, let's say I was managing someone and discovered that was a, a trait that was part of that. Again, cultural background. I loved how Aaron called that out. Very natural to end up in this space. Um, it's trained, it's learned behavior. The thing I would probably do if I realize that they're struggling to give feedback is again, get them to start giving feedback to me. Let's start practicing. Okay. You're going to give me, I'm, I'm your manager. I want you to give me critical feedback. Also, I want you to start giving other people positive feedback. All right. So let's, let's hold on negative, like neutral or positive, express your opinion about something, a different way that you might do something. Oh, that, that might work. Here's another thing that might work. What do you think? Right. Just get them in the idea of putting their opinion out into the world in a non-confrontational way. Um, so positive things, neutral things like differences, not not critiques, but just like, oh, here's a different way you might do that. Suggestions, basically. Like, here's a suggestion. Start giving people suggestions. Start giving people positive encouragement. Um, and, and start giving me critique, right? Let's start building up your ability to do and realize that I'm not, I'm not going to hate you for this. 
because actually that's that's at the root of this is that if I have the direct conversation, there there may have been a point in my past in my family or my upbringing or a previous job where I went to someone and had a direct conversation. And from that point on, they were mad at me. It put this hole in our relationship. And there's a lot that goes in the psychology of relationships that like, you know, can be dived into here. But if you've had that happen, it teaches you don't be direct. Don't be, you know, Joseph, you, you're able to do that. You're able to go forward and be direct. And probably there's people in your past that are like, I, I don't like that Joseph guy. Um, yeah. he was, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and Aaron and I both have that too. He made um, me have bad feelings. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and this is, it is, it's all like, it's emotional level and you can view like, Oh, what's the quality of the feedback and all this. But what you're really trying to create is a place where that person realizes it's okay to do that and that they should be doing that. And also once they realize they can do that for you, okay, here's, here's critique to you. And it's going to be like the smallest, most useless stuff at first. Um, fine. Enc- again, encourage, encourage it. It's in the right direction. Encourage the micro behavior that's in the right direction. You'll get more of it. And eventually it's going to get to that point where you're, they're realizing I'm giving you feedback and you're appreciating it. And then there might eventually going to be like, okay, cool. You're going to go give that critical feedback to that person you're struggling with. And you're going to, we're going to, you know, I'm going to coach you through the model and how you're going to do that. And then afterwards you're going to talk to me. And by the way, if they blow up in your face, I want you to know I have your back. Um, like I am going to, I'm not going to be a manager. You're just going to be like, what you annoyed blah. Oh, well, you're clearly dumb. Like, yep. Sorry. Nothing. I, you know, no, I have your back. I encourage this. I trained for this. You, you might even do more things to set that up. Now, as Aaron said, this is all a time investment. This is all a developmental investment you're making. And so be aware, this is time consuming. And that's where I, I, I would double down on what Aaron said. If I'm a startup and I think feedback is important, I would screen for this heavily because I may not have time right. um, or I may, sorry, I, in some sense, that would be such a priority thing. I would have to make time. It's so a time and risk thing because but it's a time, the, yeah. the, the risk is exponential at that <laughs> stage as well. If somebody exactly. being poor at giving and receiving feedback, because, yes. you know, if you, all of a sudden things go, well, your prototype's great. Your VCs are like, let's do a, you know, a, a C scale round or whatever, scale the team up to a hundred. And now you need to put seven people underneath that creative director who can't give or receive feedback. It's like, well, now you just, you just created a team wide issue instead of just an one yeah. that one person struggles with. Right. So, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's shift over to performance evaluation and the objective is often tied to skills assessment and compensation. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes a pretty sensitive topic and the ways in which performance evaluation that I've seen in my career have varied a bit and have not necessarily been super great. And so I'm wondering if you guys could talk about in your experience at you know, companies that you've worked at or where you've seen a good example, um, maybe you could talk about some of the issues and challenges and whether you have seen a good example of, of this done somewhere. Yeah. Can I just um, talk about the, uh, the, what I consider in, in my own mind, there's a paradox here or not. A, there's like, there's a contradiction and it's that when you actually look at, and I'll get to like how I think you should do this, okay. but um, in the studies that they've done on performance evaluation stuff, almost always it seems like it's a net negative for the organization. And it's really, that's really sad. And again, you can say like, well, they're just not doing it right. And yeah, that's, that's true probably in some cases. In others, it's like, this is a really hard space. And simultaneously, it's really important because if you have no way to evaluate performance except informally, um, there, the likelihood of you basically causing cultural microbiomes to start existing in your organization as different senior leaders or managers uh, have different expectations and never level set and never sort of come together to talk about what good looks like mm-hmm. is so bad. So it's, I, I view this as like that. Obviously the organization wants to be able to answer the question of how well are my people doing? Who are my best people? Like, you know, where do we need to invest work and all this different stuff? And, and I, th- but, but the reality is that most companies, even with their performance evaluation systems have no idea. Um, they don't. They don't know who their best people are. They have no. They they struggle to understand that, um, and and the systems that they put in place actually seem to cause more harm than good. 
But the alternative is to just be operating in the chaos of not knowing or any individual leader's base assumptions. Like you're the CEO, right? So like whoever you like, well, obviously they're good. And whoever you don't like, well, obviously they're bad. That's honestly what a lot of this can boil down to in the absence of any of these systems. And and I hope we can all have the humility to acknowledge like that's probably not a good system, actually, especially as organizations scale. You 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 shouldn't trust your judgment that much because we all do bias towards the people that are like us and away from the people that are different than us. And that's distinct from their ability to be productive. Um, so anyway, that that to me is like there's a there's a real challenge here. There's like these tend not to work. They tend to be really bad. They tend to cause more harm than good. And simultaneously, I absolutely understand why organizations very much want to have them because they're trying to figure out who to promote and who to give raises to and what type of person we want to hire and all this different stuff. It's a real, it's a real conundrum. I, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen a performance evaluation system that was, um, that felt really good and very satisfying overall. And I'm left to kind of take a step back and go ask two questions. Um, one, what is the purpose of the performance review? Right. Because um, I, I get really, I get really um, skeptical when I see stuff where it's like, well, we have this massive job family. And it's like, well, how do we know if somebody's a producer G4 and when they're going to move up to a producer G6. And so we need the performance. And I'm just like, when we start talking about that stuff, it almost feels like it's about um, like the, the pro the process. It's like the cart before the horse, the process is leading mm -hmm. the organization. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second thing I ask is like, what are we signaling that we value through the performance evaluation? And yeah. depending on the way you execute the performance evaluation, you're probably signaling some things deliberately and you're probably signaling some things non-deliberately. And I know this sounds abstract, but it's actually really important. Um, a, a classic example of this is something Ben referenced earlier where it's like, well, we do the 360 review. Like if you do 360 reviews are very popular right now. Mm -hmm. We have everyone go through this massive exhausting gauntlet of feedback right before <laughs> we then decide who gets paid more and less. Mm -hmm. So whether or not, you know, like when you go ask, you're like, well, why don't we separate these? Well, you know, it makes sense and we have to do it this time and it's a lot of work. So it's like, you know, we've got the financial people over here doing these things. And it's like, they have a lot of like reasonable explanations for why they glued the two together. Here's the problem though. You're a manager and you're giving, you're writing feedback for one of the the people that you work with, one of the other leaders you work with, you recognize while you're writing this feedback that over the last six months, you've had quite a bit of friction with this person and you've been too busy to talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. So you're now in a pickle. Your rule for yourself is that you always want to have a conversation with somebody face to face before you start writing something on the permanent record. Mm -hmm. But you, it's, you know, three days from Christmas Eve, the performance reviews are due in 72 hours and promotions are coming up right after that. So what do you do? Well, the obvious answer is you just don't write that part down. You keep that part to yourself. And so now the entire system is breaking down, right? Because of the incentives that are present there. And again, I, I want to apologize for how abstract this is, but like this is the kind of stuff that I think I would like to see leaders at companies thinking more about because you just you now you have a crappy 360 review that didn't capture some critical feedback. Um, you had some probably follow ups that, if it were just about feedback only and not about promotions and stuff, that they probably would have just been like, "Well, I need to schedule something with this person. It's no big deal. We're just going to do the 360s again in three months." It it it, it eases that 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 friction. Um, and then also, yeah, you have like an incredible recency bias as well. So now you have 360 reviews where like a bunch of people are like, oh crap, I'm, I'm going to be as nice as I can also, because I don't want to screw up this person's promotion. I know the mm -hmm. first thing their manager is going to do when they're talking about compensation increases, is pull this, well, this great information I have like available, they're going to pull that up. And so now you have the pressure of like, well, I don't want to be the reason that this person doesn't get a promotion or I don't want to like hand their boss ammunition. To not give them a raise. And so now all of a sudden, again, the whole system is now warping 
around the reality of what you, of the situation you've put people in. And so I don't think any specific process solves that because now this is, these are the processes that I think are actually the more well-intended ones from the, from a cultural perspective. The other ones, which are literally just about checking boxes, like the traditional corporate hierarchical structures um, yeah. are, it's a, it's almost like it doesn't even really matter that much. I feel like what the content is, it's more about the system and more about the process. Um, yeah, I think, again, the question is, the core question is like, what is actually being signaled? What are, what are the real behaviors that are happening and what are the real outcomes? And are you actually getting the information you need? Like I, that always bugged me after we did 360 reviews and I saw managers just walking around, waving them around. Like, look, my person did really well. They got great feedback on the 360. And I'm like, did you not have any other information about their performance over the last year than that one document? Like, did you, do you not have us back to your point, Joseph, about like how to keep that evergreen and what's the process? Like, do you not have like a series of 90 day plans where you can illustrate that they have or have not met their objectives set over the last year? Like, where was your diligence before the, okay. the performance review or the 360 review? And, and that always bugged me. Like when I would go, like, you know, we'd have our meetings or we'd go in with the senior leaders into a room and we'd talk about like we'd share information on like who we thought was up for a promotion, who we thought deserved a compensation increase. We'd look at the ranges and everything like this. And we'd, we'd sort of collaborate as a group of leaders. And I'd often see leaders come in and say, well, look at all the nice things everybody said about Bob on his 360. And I'd be like, yeah, but Bob hasn't met an objective in like the last six months, like just factually speaking. Like I'm, I, I have a bunch of people that work on the same projects that he does and they right. they a single thing out of Bob. I don't give a shit that like seven people thought he was a really nice guy. <laughs> review. And they'd be like, oh, really? I didn't realize that. And I'm like, well, okay. Mm -hmm. So now we have a systemic breakdown here, right? So, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm perhaps a little bit more shrewd than most managers right. when it comes to this, but it's like, that's the, those are the kinds of things I think about when I think about performance evaluation, right? Is it's yeah. actually, I think yeah. about 80% of it should be the work that the managers are doing every day to like set clear expectations. Um, I really think if you, that's one benefit of doing that. If you're actually on top of that and proactive about that as a manager, by the time performance evaluations come around, it's easy. Yeah. It's easy. So, so I want to, I want to try to answer your question. Cause I said I was going to around like, okay, well, how would you set up a system? Right. Cause okay. again, yeah. it, it, it can be an organizational imperative. One, I think you don't do it if you're really small, if you're, if you're a startup or even moving up, like, you know, I don't know what the number is, probably somewhere between 50 and 500. Somewhere in there, this is going to start becoming an issue. And I think one of the reasons is the performance evaluation is, to Aaron's point, it, it can be a level setting tool. It, it, it is attempting to some level to ensure fairness um, in, inside of the system so that one person who's you know politically influential isn't giving all of their people a quarter of a million dollar a year salaries um, just because they happen to be really good friends with the CEO and they're good at raving about all their people, regardless of performance out of that space. Right. Um, so you, you have performance evaluations, you sort of have, you set expectations, you, you know, you make the job family or whatever boxes when you're very small, don't worry about it. Um, second thing we talked about the idea of, um, if you have a formal feedback system, Instead of doing formal feedback system, then performance evaluation, do it the other way. Do it right after. Do the feedback after we've decided who gets promoted or whatever, right? Like if you're going to do them at the same time, do the performance evaluation first. And that is a clear signal also to the managers that, hey, you don't get to wait till, as Aaron was saying, you've gotten a bunch of feedback from the 360 so that that basically you get to shortcut your responsibility to actually understand how your people are doing. That is not okay. Um, you need to know that in an ongoing way. So what we're going to do is we're going to line that up after. And if the only thing you have to say in our performance evaluation conversations about like who's going to get a raise or not is like, well, five months ago, let's say these people said nice things about them. That's a, you're failing as a manager. Um, so then how do you actually do the performance evaluation bit? Like what do you evaluate people on? And here I... I like to, I've seen a bunch, I've seen like potential, skills, technical capability, all these different things suggested. My two favorites are, are you culturally aligned with the organization? So do you manifest the behaviors we like to see in developers on a day-to-day -day basis? 
That's one of your axes. And the other one is something like performance or value delivered. And I, I that is not the same as skill set, right? You might be an mm-hmm. amazing coder, but if you're spending all your time coding things that aren't valuable, that aren't solving the problem, I don't care about that. So I care about like your ability to contribute to value delivery and your cultural alignment. If you're off on cultural alignment over time, you become you become someone who creates anti-pattern behavior. And I don't want to promote someone who's creating anti-pattern behavior, right? Because if I promote you when you're culturally misaligned, now I'm showing that to the company that you can get promoted while being culturally misaligned. And I encourage cultural misalignment through right. that. Performance, regardless, again, of technical capability and cultural alignment, if you're failing to deliver, like Aaron was saying, you might be the nicest guy and you might really be great at culture, but your outcomes are terrible. You are not able to perform. You are not able to deliver value. Um, in that world, I take that person and I say like, hey, cool. We're excited about your cultural alignment. We have to work on these outcomes. Like, how are we going to help you be more effective? Because if you imagine a company that has massive cultural, everybody's giving each other feedback and we're all, you know, behaving in healthy ways and we're non-toxic team members, but all the value is zero, we're going to go out of business. So we need performance. We need value delivered. We need outcomes and we need cultural alignment. And so those are the two axes I pick. I don't care what your skill sets are. Uh, I don't care. And there's one that is always funny. People, you, I, I've seen this done with like, we'll, we'll evaluate them based on their potential. And I was like, that is, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know if you follow any sports. I watch some sports. It's always funny when they have, you know, oh, there's this phenome, you know, prodigy 19 year old football star in Germany or something like that. And they're like, oh, he's going to be the next, you know, Ronaldo or something, you know, and there, there's all this and they're all attempting to predict someone's potential and they are wrong so much more often than they are right. Um, yeah. if, that, if predicting someone's potential tries to predict the future in a way that we're just not well, well set up to do, but we think we are. So I actually don't like it as a metric because we really think we can tell who's going to be great and who's not going to be great. Um, but it, it's actually way harder than we think, especially once that person starts getting training and starts giving, getting growth opportunities and all this stuff. So it's those, but yeah. So don't pick potential. I don't like potential as an axis. I don't like uh, technical capability as an axis. I like performance slash value slash outcome, cultural uh, and behavior. Yeah. And just to maybe uh, go one level deeper in terms of like thinking about, or maybe, maybe we're actually to pull out a little bit and think about mm-hmm. systems more generically. So it does seem like the kind of, general kinds of ways in which people might do performance evaluation systems could be, as you stated, Ben, like um, based upon skills or uh, characteristics, and then you can do a 360 and have different people evaluate you based upon those skills for Mm -hmm. the role. The second would be setting up, you know, oftentimes quarterly targets. So performance, Mm -hmm. like I will do these things and, you know, hit these specific things. Um, there are some companies who actually also use OKRs as performance, even though, even though mm-hmm. I don't think they were designed for that, but some yeah. people do. And yeah. then there's also the very controversial uh, methodology around stack ranking, which I, I think people got mad at uh, Blizzard for. <laughs> so when, when you think about those different systems, uh, could you just maybe, maybe you guys could just kind of highlight a few caveats or, you know, gotchas around those systems Sure. Yeah, I actually really like the idea of having uh, more quarterly updates or smaller term tactical plans roll up into the performance review because mm-hmm. then, um, you know, c- because of those two axes Ben mentioned, mm-hmm. the um, results and culture, I think you tend to get more of the culture stuff naturally through a 360 type environment mm-hmm. and it helps cover the results side more effectively, which I think frames the overall results. As far as things like stack ranking and, and things like that, there, there are some weird things out there. Yeah. Uh, let me talk about OKRs for a second. Um, you're right. They weren't designed for that. And I, I don't, I, I immediately ask myself, like, why are you trying to use that other than that OKRs are really popular right now? Mm-hmm. Um, like everyone loves OKRs. It's like one of those things that everyone just talks about all the time. But I'm like, what is the specific value that OKRs bring to performance evaluation? Perhaps I'm missing it. I, I don't, um, I mean, again, I, I, I like the idea of setting targets 
like managers setting targets with their yep. people, but like sit down and have the conversation and then set the targets and then write it down on a spreadsheet, like write four bullets on a spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. As long as the people that are relevant understand what it means and it's clearly dotted lines back up into the organization's higher level goals, you're good. And like to, to a large degree, I tend to be like, well, there's 80% of that is human judgment, no matter what system you build. So if you don't trust the human judgment of the humans in your system, you have bigger problems than whether you're using OKRs or not. So I, I would just say like, for me, that's literally what I do. I have like a little spreadsheet that I use. It's like the 90 day plan. And I sit down and I'm like, okay, what are the four things we're going to knock out or like four goals we're going to hit? And if they hit those and I agree and they agree and their team agrees, like we're winning. Like I, do, I don't need a specific goals framework for that. I, I don't think. Yeah. Um, as far as stack ranking, there, there's a lot of this kind of stuff. Like it's it's weird. So here's the problem with stack ranking. Unless your whole company is culturally exactly on the same page about what kinds of things go into the stack rank, Ben and I have a phrase, which is there's there's explicit culture, which is the stuff that everyone talks about, you know, like you, you can have a conversation it's written about, on the wall, written on the wall. And there's implicit culture, which are all the behaviors that people actually do every day that no one really talks about. The things that people bitch about around the water cooler as sort of being the frustrating parts of working at that company. Um, but th but they're, they're not written on the wall. It's like, you know, like feedback is often indirect and highly political. Like that one's not going to be written on the wall, right? But like we all know that's how it actually is to work here. The point I'm making is like all of that stuff, all of the explicit and the implicit is going to go into your stack ranking. Like if the truth about the way your company works is that if everyone really, really likes Sally because she's super fun and she has a bar near her uh, area of work and she, you know, and she's amazing and throws the best parties. And, and so, you know, but she, like she hasn't delivered anything in a year, like and she gets high on the stack. Like she might be higher on the stack rank just because of that. If that's something that you value, but you don't talk about a lot, so it's there. There's or you know, or if or if Jim, like you know, uh, Ben said earlier, he has a great backdoor relationship with the CEO and goes over to his house and has pool parties and watches his kids on the weekend or whatever. Like these things, it, it sounds ridiculous, but these things will find their way into your stack ranks if you don't have like clear cultural boundaries around this stuff. So like, I, I don't also the weird, that's a weird kind of comparative system too, that I'm like, I'm not sure makes sense. I, I understand the intentions of it, right? It's like, it helps you anchor with your high performers and things like that. But again, you better know and be confident in the criteria on which you're measuring high performance. Otherwise your whole system breaks before you even well, start. You, you also have discipline to discipline differences. So when I think of, yeah. Um, Stack ranking, right? Okay, so I'm going to stack rank. Do I stack rank across a team? Do I stack rank discipline? Most people will stack rank discipline because yeah. they're like, I'm comparing like to like. Yep. Okay, cool. What if I, well, one, I might have game designers, right? And I've got some game designers that are working on a live service game, and I've got some game designers that are working in R&D. Okay, cool. What? How easy is it for me to compare those two things? Because the while they technically all touch inside of the design discipline, the connection between them hierarchically, structurally, is like you almost have to go up to the top of the org often before you reach it. And so how aligned are these managers? How much are they talking? All these things. And even if they are, what if I did a really great job hiring designers and I've got like eight designers on my team and they're all killing it and their teams love them? Well, now I stack rank them and one of them is in the bottom 10%, right? And there have been places like, there have been places that have said, if you're in the bottom 10%, we have to fire you. Right. Um, that's the rule. That's our rule. We stack rank. We say bottom 10%, mid, middle 70, top 20% or whatever. Like, you you know, they usually do some sort of division around that. Someone's going to be at the bottom. What if they're actually doing amazingly well? It's just that everybody else is doing even better or, to Aaron's point, has a manager who's better able to advocate for them. Yeah. Um, because, it, because the differences get really subtle. Simultaneously, what if I have a discipline where everybody's really struggling? Um, and again, you hopefully don't have this, but maybe if you were a startup and you weren't so worried about a particular discipline, you hired in some people, their lower skill, they were associates, like maybe straight out of college, you just got a few people. Well, now you have a set of people and someone's going to be like the best. 
And so like, okay, well, our rules say, you know, again, what are you trying to do with a stack rank? Our rules say we need to promote you or we need to give you a raise or whatever. The, be careful about the structure replacing human judgment when it comes to these decisions. And that's where the stack ranking can be can be troubling. One of the things Ben and I will do a lot, by the way, that we'll introduce as a concept to organizations is the difference between role and title. So like when we when we tend to think about titles, we'll think about your discipline and sort of the core skill set that you bring to the table. And that's mm-hmm. mainly so that when other people look at your job title, they can make a set of a generally true assumptions about what kind of skills you have. And that's about it. But like a, another great example of where this can break down that I've actually seen in many different types of performance evaluation systems is um, let's say you have a producer and producers are generally like the processy people, right? They make the spreadsheets. They do the Jira projects at your, at your company. They're, they're the organizers, the operators. What if you have a producer that had a creative d- director that got really, really sick on their team and then they stepped into the, the product role? the creative direction role. They had a little bit of design chops or maybe not in the past and they did an amazing job. But as a result, they had to let drop a bunch of their like traditional sort of task management or operator responsibilities because they thought that the the creative role was actually the more important role for the team at that time. And now all of a sudden they're dropping balls in what is traditionally seen as their core areas of responsibility. And now they're being stack ranked lower, even though they're actually technically adding more value to the organization. And perhaps from another lens might even be more valuable as a producer because they're more flexible in what roles they can take on. These are a lot of like the nuances and subtleties that like a lot of these very official systems tend to not take into account. And that's where, again, the human judgment thing is so important. Like I love the idea of an engineer stepping into a product role because that's what their team needs or like a producer that can, you know, can, can do some creative direction as well or whatever it is. I think that that flexibility in an organization and allowing teams to sort of dynamically coalesce around certain roles and, and, and being open about what value looks like and not like strictly boxing people into their specific, like, you know, you're a producer. So where's your spreadsheet? Like, or whatever it is, I think is actually a really good thing. Right. There's, um, and I'm sorry, we're going on this one. I'm, I'm looking for a quote right now. Tell me how you'll measure. How you'll measure. I'll tell you how you, I behave. Was that was that Goldrat or yeah, Deming? Yeah, Goldrat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, so Eli who Goldrat um, wrote a book called The Goal, worth reading even now uh, for sure. One of the things he was quoted as saying is, "Tell me how you measure me, and I'll tell you how I'll behave." Right. And that um, that comes into all of this. If people think if people are stack ranked, then they're going to try to be high in the stack rank. So you have to be really careful how you stack rank. That's how I would say that. Right. Not saying you could never do a stack rank and have it work, but if you do it, you better be really clear what's important. Because if what's important is to know the right people, then all your people are going to try to figure out how to know the right people, or they're going to get knocked out of your stack rank regardless of their effectiveness. If it's right. technical capability, you kind of asked earlier, what if I have someone and I evaluate them based on their technical skill? Well, if you do that, then you're going to have everybody chasing technical skill. And one of the challenges in video game development is technical skill does not equal good product necessarily. I'm not saying you don't need some technical skill. People need to be good. Like if I had nobody who knew how to develop games and I tried to make a game, it wouldn't probably wouldn't go too well. But I want people who are great game developers and great at adding value to the product. And if their portfolio or their CV, if they're an artist or something, doesn't look quite as shiny because they're not as expert in a classically like art space, I'm okay with that if they're phenomenal at creating the concepts I need to get my game done. So when you when you evaluate everybody on their technical aptitude, it seems like it's really easy. You're comparing like to like, but the reality is that there's so much more to results than your ability to write code, you know, find bugs, um, create art, all that different stuff. And actually, Joseph, to, to that point, I think a mm-hmm. stack rank, one area I could see a stack rank being super valuable is if a bunch of senior leaders or managers got into a room to talk about the their overall discipline team and they wanted to sort of like stimulate a good conversation, let's stack rank all of our people and then talk about why we right. view like 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 to use that almost as a way to surface what we're valuing. Oh, right. it's like okay, um, Tom thinks his guy is number one on the stack rank. Well, why? Why does he think he ta- his guy is above these other four? Oh, it turns out that he is focusing more on technical aptitude, whereas I'm focused more on culture. Right. And like it could that those kinds of conversations, if you didn't use it outside of that room, could actually be a really good way to get the juices flowing and expose some of those 
assumption. Yeah, so, it could, so you're saying it could be useful depending on the way it's utilized, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Because ultimately yeah. it's a tool. Yep. yep. Yeah. And and the am like again that I, I pick on Amazon here. I think they did away with this, but when they had the like, you know, top twenty percent or thirty percent get a raise or a <clears throat> promotion or whatever, at you know middle or seventy or whatever, and then bottom ten percent get fired. Little seven percent, like you know, maybe a small bump, like keep up with inflation. Bottom ten percent, you get fired. When you create those systems, it seems it's what what you are literally doing is removing human judgment from the evaluation of human behavior. And you're letting the system do that. Mm -hmm. Now, look, maybe at scale, they're like, well, that pays off for us in the long run. I mean, the military solved this whole problem by just saying everybody makes the same thing based on rank and time and service, period. So whether you're the best captain the Army's ever seen or the worst, if you've both been in for six years, you make the same amount of money. We don't care, right? Adjusted for your location um, based on cost of living. That's it. They they simplified the systems so that there's no there's no need for any of these that they still do performance evaluations and reviews and they're quite uh, inbred in the way they function like if you're not if anybody if anybody isn't top block it's a huge red flag that something is wrong which is hilarious because top block I think it's like top ten percent it's like everybody knows that's a lie um, so anyway so they like their system becomes contrived around this. Um, in, in, I think, a very negative way. So, yeah, what are you using it for? Now, there was a middle system that you mentioned. You said technical evaluation, something, and then you said... Um, yeah, so basically uh, ranking. evaluation around skills or characteristics, one. Second would be yeah. around performance targets, right? So, like, yes. you know, every okay. quarter... Yeah, go ahead. So, okay, so so here's the thing. I love, like Aaron was saying, setting expectations. <laughs> if you want to use a no-care model, fine. They were designed for organizational units, like teams or groups not for individuals and i think there are some things that sh that struggle when they get down to the individual level because if you think about the team versus the individual there's actually a much more variance in an individual's life and work than there is in a teams um so there's just a lot more like up and down and if someone has some things outside of work go wrong or even some things inside of work not go the way they expected it's easy for them to look like they're a dud because they didn't hit any of their goals. That's also where, again, be careful of these systems replacing human judgment. Um, because what people will do is they'll set easy goals. And yeah. they'll find a way, not only will they set easy goals, but they'll find a way to convince you that their easy goals are hard. If Again, tell me how you measure me, I'll tell you how I'll behave. Well, it seems like at this organization, people that set four goals and hit them all get raises and promotions. Okay, what are four goals I could set that I could swing past my manager that, I, that I'm almost positive I could succeed at that will give me a raise and a promotion. And by the way, you can see that as like, oh, that's manipulative of the system. It's like, no, that's exact, in some sense, that's exactly what they should be doing for their own job security. Um, because they also know that if I set four really hard goals and I hit none of them and no one cares that they were really hard goals, uh, if I'm punished for that, you better believe I'm going to set easier goals next time and easier goals next time until I get to the point where I'm just knocking them all out. And then you're going to have an entire organization of people knocking out easy goals and nobody taking on the hard challenges. And so this is where the conversation should be. I want you, I'm your manager, I'm evaluating you. I want you to set hard goals. I want you to take on big challenges. I want you to really try to move the company forward in whatever your area of expertise is. And I also understand that you're not always going to get there. Just know that I'm going to help you. And when we get to the end, we're going to talk about what happened and why you did or didn't get there. And when you're in that world and you're encouraging that and they're not punished because of circumstances that were outside of their control and that sort of thing, um, you know, that's when you can start really having, uh, again, the human judgment. The yeah, human I think, judgment I think that, that, that approach is critical. Like I, I'm shocked at how few companies do that, Joseph, the, um, the sort of more regular evaluations, because actually when you do them more often, it reduces the weight of any one individual evaluation. Mm -hmm. And so if you do take on a couple crushingly difficult challenges and you don't nail any of them, then the next time you might be able to actually be like, okay, well, let's do too hard and too reasonable. And, and so you can find a balance there. Um, between delivery and risk taking, yeah. whereas like if it's all one big bang at the end of the year, it's it's like it has to be good, right? I I also want to call it you. You said at the beginning you're doing start stop continue monthly. Yeah, it's good. and one kudos to you because that's a time investment, and I know it is. I know that that's like probably taking 
putting a lot of meetings on the calendar for you and the other managers in your organization. Um, and also, I think it's probably um, a really good thing long term for your company. But I'm just curious. That's my opinion. Like, how is it working for you? I think, you know, it's 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 funny because if I'm late, they'll ask for it. <laughs> and so, nice. so I, I do think because it isn't tracked and because, you know, it is in really solely intended for the benefit of the person receiving the feedback. Uh, and it's not tied to performance evalu evaluation or compensation or anything like that. I do feel like it's been better received and better mm -hmm. uh, acted upon at, at our company. And, and, and to your point, like, you know, we are a small company. So, you know, I've, I, I do need to figure out performance evaluation at some point. But um, I would say, at least from a feedback perspective, I think that as a startup, we want a system that's not overly formalized or too heavy. And it felt mm. like this was a good way of just being focused on the person. We just need you to get better, try to get better. And I don't know, I, I so far it's been, uh, I think more effective than anything I've tried or experienced in the, in, in my past, but, mm. um, you know, I, uh, so I, at least for us, it seems to be working. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, way to go. Like I said, it's, it, I know that stuff is time consuming and I really appreciate that you're putting that time and it's, it's really cool that they, that your people seem to be appreciating it too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think it's not as time consuming if you make it a habit. So like I, I actually keep mm. a, 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 like a, you know, kind of like a, a notebook and like anytime I notice something, I'll, I'll write it down, then I'll try to talk to them there and then it'll nice. re reappear in the start, stop, continue. So, mm -hmm. and I also nice. think the other thing that is an advantage is like, I've realized that some people take feedback in different ways. And so if something happens and you talk to them verbal, and then it shows up in the start, mm -hmm. stop, continue written. And so by having it kind of reinforced both ways, yeah. and then you get it both times, I think it, it, it that helps as well. That's yeah. pretty cool. I like that. So, so if basically you're using discipline, your, your own personal discipline in like a habit loop, like a pattern mm -hmm. of behavior um, to, to make this feel, it's just, it just doesn't feel as costly because it's like, hey, we know this is how we operate. And I remember to jot my notes down. That's, that's really cool. I love that. Great. Um, so I thought I could ask one last question. And this is a question around uh, uniformity. And so you know, mm -hmm. whatever system you have, people are going to be behind that system. So whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, um, the evaluation of skills for me to anyone, or whether it's stack rank or anything. And so when it comes to like, and, and I actually have heard this might be a problem at, at Riot, where you have like the hard dude and the easy dude, <laughs> and depending on who's giving the, or who's executing the performance evaluation, yeah. You know, it, it can have a pretty dramatic impact yeah. on whether you get that raise or whether yep. you get the promotion. Yep. And so like Aaron and I were hard managers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting what, what you say. And actually there were a lot of like the older school, I think at Riot were harder in yeah. general. Um, like there was a particular time where I'm like, with the first thought I ever had, which was where I was like, I, I overheard water cool conversations of people saying things like, well, I might want to try to switch over to this person because people like this person really does promotions. Like their, their people get promotion. <laughs> and and I, like that was probably, that didn't start happening until probably about halfway through my time at Riot. And by the way, I think that, you know, you can't avoid this sort of thing at any company as you, mm -hmm. especially when you scale this aggressively. Right. Um, and, and, and to be honest, there's a lot of weird incentives there too, because for that manager it can look really good without, and not even in a malicious way, but like if all their mm -hmm. people are just constantly getting promoted all the time, it looks like they're running an amazing team. Right. right. So, um, and, and, um, I had, people, I had people give me advice at one point when I was switching projects saying, Hey, you know, you're switching managers, you're switching parts of the organization. Like this isn't going to be as, um, beneficial for your career trajectory, even though this problem is harder and the company is saying they really need this, this isn't going to be this pro this is a less percentage chance of turning out well for you as it would if you just stayed here right. with us. And so um, I, I think 
You do need uniformity, but like when I think about uniformity, I don't again think of like the job architecture that you have at like EA or something like that, or even like honestly, I think Riot has a pretty robust job architecture, and I don't, I don't nowadays, and I don't know the details behind it, so I can't really like assess it. I've just been disconnected for too long, but um, you know, certainly there is an over -def defining you can do with this stuff. Um, what I would say though, is the, the uniformity I would want is like, what does it mean to be like a senior producer or what does it mean to be a senior technical artist? What does it mean to be a mid-level technical artist? And, and specifically in terms of capability and ability to demonstrate certain kinds of results. Like, I think there actually needs to be uniformity around that. And interestingly, I don't feel like Riot ever had that. Um, and I've, I don't believe I've ever really seen a company that had that in a way that was satisfying to me. And again, I think a lot of those job, job architectures are supposed to solve that, but the, the, they almost go, they almost solve it by doing it in like a checklist way where mm -hmm. it's like, you did this, you do that, your team's this big. And I'm like, those are not the things that matter actually. So interestingly enough, um, one of the things Ben and I would do, for example, just a, one example one of the key differences between a mid-level producer and a senior level producer, this is like our own brand that we created, was when you become senior, you need to understand the concepts that you apply on your teams deeply enough to be able to actively teach them to other teams and other producers that are more junior than you. Secondly, you need to be able to actually create frameworks now within which teams can succeed. It's not enough for you to go in and manage directly the tasks on your team to make sure the team's staying efficient. You need to be able to put in place a structure and a set of habits and a set of behaviors on that team that they can be more operationally efficient such that if you left that team, they would still keep doing that. That system would sustain itself beyond you being there every day. And they would know how to solve that problem. And so th there's a, again, there's a level of abstraction there, which is like, you're not just a doer anymore. You're now a teacher and you're a systems builder and a systems thinker. And, um, and you can repeatably do on many different kinds of teams, what you've proven you can do on a couple teams that you worked on personally. So there's an elevation there. And that's just one of many examples we had, but like, I think that those roles need to be defined in that way when it comes to specific outputs and capabilities that I that I don't um, often see a lot of companies focus a lot on. And and again, there even with that, there's still going to be a degree of nuance that requires human judgment. So Joseph, could can you restate the question real quick? I just want to make sure I captured it because I, I want to figure out if there's anything I have relevant there. Sure. Yeah. Basically like the concern is that there could be different managers who even with whatever system you're using, have a different basis of judgment or evaluation, yeah. whether it's characteristics or yeah. a, a set of performance target to manager A might be like, oh, that's yeah. incredibly difficult. And so manager B may say, oh, that's super easy. And so depending yeah. on the specific manager you have that's executing a performance evaluation, yeah. the you know your mileage oh, will be Oh, I see. So you mean so, like at how a manager would assess certain outcomes being easy to do or hard to do. Or, or but, but overall, like, but that has an outcome in terms of like, you know, your performance evaluation will be different based yeah. upon mm -hmm. the person. Yes. Yep. So, okay. so this is where um, what Aaron was saying earlier, um, I love that he brought this up. There was a... He and I were both involved in conversations where you would get together with a lot of other of the managers and hiring managers mm -hmm. um, around performance evaluation times, or or and and you'd basically try to level set. Um, and this is one of the best ways to do what you're talking about. Um, I think this person's high performing, right? And again, clearly defined axes uh, will be helpful here, right? So let's say you pick the ones I like. You pick culture and then outcomes. Delivered right, like so. Good, did you get, are you getting outcomes? How good are you at aligning to the culture? Now someone is walking through why they think someone is or is not good in that space. Um, like, hey, these these are the things that matter to us. Great. You think this person's? You know, it, we, there's different systems you can use. Nine box, sixteen box, totally. Like, create several axes and have everybody mm -hmm. jot down a number or whatever. Like, there's different stuff you can do. Um, 
getting in that room and having that conversation will surface the disagreements, especially by the managers that are near each other with different perspectives. Uh, because I, I was in those rooms sometimes and I would see somebody and they would be like, this person's amazing. And I was like, wait, <clears throat> tell me why. And you know, the most common reason is the one that we've talked about a lot, which is, well, everybody likes them, but sometimes it was actually more subtle. It was, well, they seem really good at doing this process stuff. And I was like, okay, how has that led to outcomes? And sometimes the answer was like crickets. And I was like, like, what is it that they've actually done? Who have they helped? You know, we're as leaders, in our case, we were producers, right? So we're talking about production. Production, our pro producers are generally force multipliers, not direct ads to the product. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how they've force multiplied their organization. Well, you know, they like refined the process and they did yeah, but did the, tell me why that helped. Tell me why that helped everybody. And sometimes it was, we don't actually know. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like they were really good at Jira or Excel or Fav. Or I, I like that you brought that up um, then because that meeting will help surface that. So now that that person yes. might have just ran and gave that person a promotion. But now because there was accountability amongst their peers at the same right. level, it was like, and, well, hey, wait a second. You're about to promote this person, but this person has done the same amount of process work and delivered. The right. results or and still or whatever, you know, or it's like they haven't done any process work, but look at the outcomes from the yeah, teams exactly. that are leading. Look at the problems that they identified that we're going to trip this whole giant, you know, 400 person project up. It was, we were going to be a disaster and they spotted these problems. That's somebody who I want to elevate. And by the way, when you talk about that, too, in the same way of like the impact feedback um, in that conversation, it's not you're dumb for thinking that person's great. No, it's hey. What do we want to see more of in our organization? That's what should be the outcome of those sort of like the easy and the hard manager need to align on. What yeah, do we, we want, want to see, see more, more of? of really, really great spreadsheets and processes and Favreau boards and Trello boards? And is that, is that what we want more of? Because, you know, if, we're, if you find your, that a couple people want to promote, and again, this is a very producery example, but or, or do you want um, do you want more of the producer that goes and actually like like, you know, airdrops into teams and really helps them clean up their overall systems and focus on what's valuable yeah. and deliver faster and like all the like very tangible outcomes. Right. Right. And I think I've seen this in art sometimes manifest mm -hmm. as, wow, they did such high quality concepts. And did we need high quality concepts? We were ideating. <laughs> this other person produced like 74 rough concepts that got us to an, an answer. Right, they got us to somewhere we were going. While this person was very carefully tinkering and yeah. very slowly and not iterating well, also, with the rest of Ben and I, Ben and I, quality was so beautiful. Yeah, and we like, talk we talk a lot about this actually, but that, and this is another this can be another challenge again with stack ranking. And it's funny when I when I have an allergic reaction to stack ranking as a tool that is used broadly and organizationally, mm -hmm. and it's not. But it is funny. It's not because of stack ranking itself. It's because of the way that I see most leaders in game development thinking. It's like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody be like, this person is the best artist, or this person is the best engineer. Like you will never find an engineer like this guy. I mean, he like the, the, the everything, all the code he touches turns to gold. And it's like, therefore they are a, an ad to the company. And it's like, I, I have seen many situations, not even just a few where the person with the most technical aptitude was not the highest outcome producer on their team. Mm -hmm. And like that, that is not an uncommon scenario in game development. So I always worry when I hear people like there's, there's an almost obsession with technical aptitude in game development. Like if I, I think there's a lot of leaders out there who really believe if I have the best artists, the best engineers, the best VFX people, the best, you know, like that I will create the best product. And I'm like, uh, that is not, a one-to-one -one in my mind at all, like not even close. And in fact, I've seen many situations where I worked with a team of like lower technical aptitude people, um, perhaps more junior, and they were because of their willingness to collaborate and generally be more agreeable 
with each other and like actually like lean into like working as a team and being open about how to solve problems and not being stuck in their ways or whatever, they were able to run circles around the quote unquote senior team. And so it's, it's, uh, it's something to be careful about, I think, yeah. for leaders. Yeah. Nothing, nothing wrong with being a senior, just like there's nothing wrong with being junior. It's just, it's just be, be aware that there's actually a collaboration is more important than technical aptitude. Your ability to collaborate well and deliver actual outcomes. Um, and it takes a lot of humility uh, to, to think do that well. So, uh, yeah, I think that's the answer that I would give to your question of how do you kind of try to level set? And it is we'll bring those people together in a room and have them talk about it. Yeah. You, one of the one of the challenges with all these systems is that we are humans. We're in human systems, and human mm -hmm. systems have politics. Yep. Um, and they have influence games, and they have like somebody is friends with the CEO, and somebody else isn't, and all this different stuff. And you know that you can't fix that through any process. Um, you can attempt to mitigate it. And if you, if you focus hard and carefully on culture and behavior, you can minimize the impacts. Um, but it's always going to be there to some extent. And I think that's one of the other things is like aim, aim for a, a fair, just, equitable system, right? And try to really, really, really try to get there. But also recognize that you're probably never going to. And that's not, that's because we're humans. It's not, it's not like... It's not like you failed, you know, because someone who should have been promoted didn't get promoted and someone who shouldn't have been promoted did get the promotion or whatever. Um, you know, if you, if that becomes obvious, fix it, try to fix it. Right. Um, but also like, man, we, we make, we all make so many mistakes every day. Um, and, and even, even when, when politics and the influence game is largely benevolent and positive for an organization, which I absolutely think it can be, um, it's, it's still there. And it's still it's still contorting just a little bit, still warping just a little bit some of the the perfectly just system that you're attempting to create in performance evaluations and feedback and all these things. Great. Well, guys, I think that would be the last question for me. So maybe we could just wrap with like, if you have any last message for our audience and how can they get in touch with you guys? Yeah, I mean, uh, hit us up on social media, I think is the the quickest way to get a hold of us. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like parting advice, um, it may not be comfortable advice, but it is the truest advice for me in my career. And, and that consistently comes up with everybody I work with in our industry. Um, human judgment, good human judgment is the thing that I can most directly attribute to great games and high quality outcomes. And um, you need to build an organization that produces as much great human judgment as possible and uh, stop trying to build processes that create that because they usually have the opposite effect. Um, and if you don't know how to build it, then just hire people who already have it and have that be the number one thing you screen for, human judgment. Ask them questions about the decisions that they've made in their career and if you hear about those stories and go, wow, this person consistently makes great decisions, they might be a good fit for your team. If you want to follow us, uh, we have a podcast and a newsletter. Both are available via buildingbettergames.gg. Uh, there's a buildingbettergames.gg slash newsletter if you want to sign up for the newsletter. And the podcast is just Building Better Games. It's on Spotify and Apple and all the major um, podcast platforms. So. Awesome. And I'll provide links uh, in the show notes. Gentlemen, I really want to thank you for this conversation. You guys are incredibly deep, thoughtful, considerate guys. And I, I just really appreciate how much you, you, you guys really care about your profession. And I, I can tell just how deeply you, you have thought about many of these issues. So thank you very much. And for our audience, we will catch you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.